You ready? Michael, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Come in. Three. Three. So the audio is. You guys can all hear that? Yeah. Great. Okay, so we're going to get back started. Um, I, I introduced myself briefly on the boat, uh, but again, my name is Phil Loring. I am a professor, uh, assistant professor, I guess, still at the University of Saskatchewan. I was for about 10 years here as a PhD student and then as a postdoc um, and research faculty. And uh, what we're going to talk to you now uh, is about the North. As I said a minute ago, we want to give you some context, talk about how some of these issues, the broad themes that we're going to address throughout the two weeks of the Institute, uh, how they sort of manifest and how we see them uh, in Northern communities, Northern ecosystems. Uh, again, we are live, we're streaming online. I don't know if we have any visitors, but uh, we'll see. Um, and the way we're going to get started is I'm going to show you a short 10 minute film. It's one of six films that we made um, in a short film series called Tied to the Land. And this is, um, a, I had a filmmaker who worked with us up in the Kotzebue Sound region of Alaska. And I think this film has a map. If not, I'll show you on a map. Uh, and this, is, this film is called Sea Ice Secure. Uh, and it's just a little bit of a, a nice introduction uh, to some of these policy issues in the north. So we'll watch this here. And then we'll talk about is about food security. People's first and foremost concerns here politically, socially, and spiritually is subsistence. And subsistence isn't merely hunting and fishing. It's about the life way that ties the essence of who we are as a people to the land. You're looking at um, thinner ice and warming. Even though this year we had a cooler winter, the ice was not as thick as we thought it was going to be. This right here is a little When I was younger, the sea ice started forming in <laughs> October, the end of October, and it lasted all the way into June. But now, it's mid-December, end of December, and breakup is starting early as in April. The uh, ice every spring is getting thinner. <coughs> now, sometimes the ice comes into the shore, it blocks them out, and there's no way for you to get back home until it's gone. We start carrying ten feet. So if we have to put the tent up in the boat, just try to wait for you know, the ice to move back up to bring it out. Ice is getting thinner. It doesn't stay around very long anymore. We don't have as much time to hunt. I went under and crabbed in the spring. I made holes in the ice and put my small crab out there. And uh, we've never gotten more than two and a half foot thick. It's normally it's up to five feet thick. This time of the year, it'll all be frozen and we'd be out town cutting. And then we got this warm spell, which disrupted all our plans. As we fell on the ice and it's all trails between villages, it really affects us. These falls, like right now, are supposed to be freezing up and it's warm and rainy, makes a longer, longer period of no winter trails. And then when they do form, often they're, they're really dangerous because we'll have some ice and then it snows and rains a bunch on top of it. And we're seeing that form more. If you're living in the Arctic, you're asking for unpredictable weather, but the volume's turned up on that. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, three elders went out hunting out on the ice just to go seal hunting in the springtime, and they fell through the ice in conditions that were not expected. They would have known the conditions, but things changed so very much that the local traditional knowledge of the ice conditions have changed, so it's the uncertainty now. It used to be really cold and thick ice around there in springtime, and nowadays the ice is Real thin about four feet in the waters all over. Lot to Baruchas and whales used to go through there. They retreat back over three to four hundred miles. 
this zone is between 80 to 100 miles. Today, when we get the northwest wind, it does more damage to our land because there's 400 miles of water to lakes and big. There's an obvious segment of the population that they're always out there hunting and fishing. In a way, they're kind of the eyes and the ears for the rest of the community as to what may be happening or not happening. Those locations that they're going to. And sometimes we have to move to get more right now. Nice how could be hunting slow instead of getting six, seven at a time. That way I can keep up with me. There were some tracks coming out, so some guys came up not that long ago. When they find out I'm out here, they figure it's safe. So they go back home. One of the things that we think would be valuable is the Canadian version of their Department of Transportation. In Canada, they use the waterways for highways during the winter, the same way we use waterways for travel. We need to invest in the equipment that allows us to go and make a computerized model of the ice thickness along a particular path. We will do that on an annual basis to improve safety for our people. In between lakes, there's waterways and there's water moving in between lakes. If it's eight inches here, it's not necessarily eight inches there because the current in the water that's moving through there is keeping it thinner, checking or verifying that those locations like this, uh, like that, are actually safe enough. And then you GPS that route, and then you're, you've added an extra level of security using technology. Here at the borough, we'll skate the winter trail for about six months every spring, trying to maintain the level of safety for travelers. And it's become later and later that we skate those winter trails. We don't skate it until we know it's thick enough whether it's blizzard at night or whatever, they can find their way. And when they hit the trails, it'll help them get to safety. This trail is not really been used this winter to note that there's not much snow. That's uh, one of the most direct routes. There's a trail that comes here and runs across the lake to those villages. There's a trail that runs here crosses an overland portage runs here and up the river we have search and rescue efforts here that are very very important to our traveling we travel so much of the time of the year by snow machine other time of the year by boat in addition to airplanes each community has search and rescue uh, and it's and almost every case all volunteer we were able to get some funds for a regional search and rescue to help them with gas, equipment, and construct shelter cabins along the way for people who may not be able to make it to their final destination, but there's a waypoint that they can seek shelter and have heat right out of storm if necessary. Another transportation route is a nice road that gets opened up every March and April and that ice road runs into the Cobalt River, runs all the way up Norwich and then on Pan. Trying to impact party policy from a local perspective that whoever is funding the research is also funding a combination of Western and local traditional companies being provided to the same research project. At the end of the day, we, we're part of the product and we could be part of helping shape our research project. So the value that we take away from it is a product that becomes useful and valuable to us who have been taking the paper. Most of us, I think, very worried about the whole process and the whole thought of developing some of our oil resources in a very fragile environment. To do it on land is fragile enough, but we depend on so much of our food sources from the ocean. Seals, fish, whales, and it's such a large part of our diet that it causes a lot of concern. 
living here is not easy. Playing with the challenge of adaptation. We have people who are here because of the ability to be resilient, to live in some of the harshest climate anywhere. That's right. Or at least eke out a way. That's pretty amazing. So I think we're at the right place right now to be a little bit more vocal about what's in it for us when it comes to natural renewable resource development. I'm optimistic about our future because we wouldn't be here if we didn't have the ability to adapt and to resilient. Okay. <clears throat> so that is just one look. So as I said, that's just one of seven in a six, pardon me, in a series seven that we're working on. Um, and just, you know, it was just an attempt to meet from, by me to, to give you a slice of, of what part of the North is like. Um, and I want to follow it up by being really emphasizing that, that there's not just one North, there's lots of different Norths, uh, different places in, in the circumpolar North are very different from one another, even though they share some similarities regarding biogeography, climate, uh, the, the social ecological histories are different, the political ecologies are different. And we're going to give you a little bit of an overview of that right now. Um, just a real quick look, not everybody um, is used to seeing the Earth projected from the north. This is a pretty common map for me to look at. Um, and so it looks more normal to me than when we see the US. Um, so here's the north. It's a large part of the globe, right? So we go from Alaska, Canada, Greenland, all the way over areas, administrative areas in Russia, um, Scandinavia, and Canada. And one of the things in Canada we want to sh highlight was just that, again, that multiple conception of what is the North. And so oftentimes, many people talk about the territorial North, so our three uh, territories, Yukon, Northwest Territory, and Nunavut. But also, we often factor in our provincial Norths. And so when you do that, it becomes a much larger area when we're speaking about the North in Canada. And just kind of to contextualize it, I'll turn it around on you. How many people do you think live in the provincial north and the territorial north, given that vast geography? I mean, let's go in actual numbers. 200,000? Any other guesses? I'm sure Ray knows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I can't remember. <laughs> so in the three territories, there's about 107,000 people. And then in the provincial north, collectively, there's about 1.5 million. And the biggest one would be northern Ontario, which is quite large in its geography. Uh, that one has about just under 800,000 people. So spread out over this big area for people from uh, Europe, France, and Germany can fit inside Northern Ontario, in terms of geography. So, very big regions. Yeah. Uh, how did you get the guidelines for the provincial? So the provincial north, this is based on administrative regions defined by each provincial government. So a lot of them will have special pro, uh, programs targeting those, and then the territories are based on their federal boundary. And, and I'll add to that, yeah. with the large geography of Alaska, you've got about 600,000. Plus or minus, might be a little higher than that right now. Oh, Alaska would be not just <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty large. So the, the line, the state of the line is further north, is that, that's their decision to do that? that that's, way? yeah, that's their administrative boundary that they use for the north and as well as Alberta. And on the next one, there's a very similar, just this is a different definition, <laughs> using uh, boreal forests and the tree line, so subarctic and arctic. So you can see there's multiple <coughs> definitions of the north that get used in Canada, depending on who you're talking to and what you're looking at. But just to keep it in mind as we're discussing our, our multiple definitions of rural. So moving on from there to get another view of who, what the north is, who lives there. Uh, this slide here shows the proportion of indigenous peoples living in each of these regions to the total population. Uh, and you can see 
um, it's on, you know, on the most part, except for Northern Canada, it's the vast minority of people who live in these regions are indigenous people, even though these were the, as with other areas in the world, right, the original inhabitants and still, you know, if you look at some of the most rural areas, um, the primary people living in these places. Alaska is a really good example. So 649,000 people, um, a fifth of that, actually a sixth of that, um, are Alaska Native, um, and about half of which live in Anchorage and Fairbanks, and the other half live in communities that range from about 80 to 4,000 people. Most of those communities are not connected by roads. Uh, you can only get to them by plane or by snow machine or dog team in the winter, maybe by boat. Um, so we're talking very remote, very rural, small communities. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to show that's in that video is that this question of remote from what matters. Uh, you heard them talking about networks of services and search and rescue among communities. So they're remote, but they're not necessarily remote from each other for certain things. And they're not remote from a lot of their food. They are remote from where some of it, the imported foods come from, and we'll talk about the issues that that remoteness raises um, as well. Uh, just a really quick uh, sort of zo zooming in just to pitch, and all of these presentations, we'll put them on a Dropbox so you can look at them in more detail. Uh, but I, I, I'm, this is not intended to be able to read it. The reason I want you to see this is to see all the different black words. There's so much to illustrate the cultural diversity across the North. And here's Alaska and part of, the, of Northern Canada. Uh, here's uh, Chukchi, here's so, um, Eastern Russia through Siberia. You can see lots of different culture groups living in the north, and then if you go to the southern part, well, the lower quadrant of the polar projection, again, uh, Eastern Canada, uh, Scandinavia, you see uh, lots of different cultural groups living in the north, and they're all very different. They don't necessarily all share languages or traditions. Uh, you have some who are Inuit, uh, you have some that are uh, more closely related to um, the, the Native American groups that you see uh, further south on North America and so forth. But so keeping in mind that large list, if we had to list it out, of all of the different groups of, of indigenous peoples and First Nations living in the north, keep that in the back of your mind. So here's just Alaska. And what I want to show you with, with this map is so on the left, you see the primary language groups of Alaska Native people living in Alaska. And you don't need to see the names, just the colors, showing that these are fundamentally different languages or dialects in some cases. And now compare that to this biome map of Alaska as well, where you see in the middle, you see boreal forest. On the north, you see Arctic tundra and boreal Arctic, and then you see subarctic uh, tundra over here on the side, and then in the panhandle, you have deciduous rainforest. Hopefully you can all see that visually, there's a very compelling correlation of these two maps. They're very similar. Okay. Now the take home message here is not that one is driven by the other, but that they're related. And, and what you need to understand, for example, is that so many indigenous languages are very, they, 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 they embed a lot of cultural geographic information, a lot of place names, a lot of names for animals, a lot of information about local ecologies. And so it makes sense that local languages would reflect local biomes, right? So, just thinking about that linkage between the languages and, the, and, and people who are living there is important once you, when you then scale back up to the circumpolar region, you think about all of the different groups that were on those earlier maps. In each case, you could do something like this. You could say, here's a group with some very place-based culture, place-based language, and expertise, and therefore also place-based policy challenges and needs and visions for their future. And so what are these issues that people are facing? Uh, we're gonna sort of tick through these pr pretty quickly. Some of these you'll explore hopefully in a little bit more detail in the projects that you do uh, in the next couple of weeks. The first one we'll start with is climate change and, and following up really at what I think that video does pretty nicely. Um, so they were talking about sea ice. So here's one projection that's been done of the change in sea ice over time. The different colors are different months of the year. And if you go from the top, 1979, clockwise around to 2013, I think it's pretty clear. You can see for every month of the year, Arctic sea ice volume has spiraled in. They call this the, the sea ice death spiral is the name that the folks who came up with this uh, gave it. And, and it's kind of macabre, but it's true. You can see this here. And then we also have another way to visualize this, and we'll see if it'll work within 
um, the slider if I need to switch. So this is, no, I'll switch. This is a one minute, I believe, video put together by NASA of, how did they go with that? That is in the way. All of these 25 years of data animated. And that white light, white ice is the oldest ice, the blue is seasonal, so that melts and then free, refreezes. And it's going through the years, 91, 92. So you can see how the ice, the, even the seasonal ice is retreating, especially in Alaska, from the coastline. The people in the video that we made who live in Kosovo, they're living over here, so they're not even getting the same kind of ice that they haven't been uh, for some time. 2008. The change in the last few years is really just tremendous. And so there you have it, uh, a minute uh, animated over time. I, it's pretty, pretty stark. Um, pretty dramatic change for anybody who uh, is sort of skeptical that things are changing. I think that that's one of the more compelling pieces of evidence that we have to point to. So that's one change. That's affecting lots of things. Sea ice buffers coastal communities against erosion, against storms, against wave action. Um, it's a medium for transportation, as you saw, for hunting. Um, Things that's happening with the warming is so if you're not by the coast and the land, permafrost, so permanently frozen soil. Um, in lots of parts of the Arctic, subarctic soils are the, the mean annual temperature is less than zero C, which means it's frozen. Um, and but what happens when it warms is in parts of the state, parts of or parts of the north, uh, the permafrost melts. Everything that's on it slumps. So um, this is 200 meters. Uh, this the width of this thaw slump that happened in the Selawik River in Alaska. And this, this river is really important for spawning fish that people use for subsistence. It's also important for transportation. So you can see these sort of interacting on rural livelihoods, especially livelihoods that are so dependent on the land, uh, when something dramatic like this happens to the landscape. And this map here on the right-hand side, uh, in the, the dark purple is continuous permafrost. That's, that's where you look, uh, frozen, what's going on here? Um, Frozen land. I wonder why did that went away again. Sorry. And then in the the lighter purple between the yellow, that's discontinuous permafrost, and that's where the real action is happening because that's where it's already sort of a, a, the the edge, and that's where the melting is happening as the warming begins, and it's already already happening. Um, and so, as I said, sea ice. And permafrost are also important in terms of the, the stability of the land, and they're both losing both is contributing to erosion. Um, so if you almost can't even see it in this picture on the left. You see these little buildings here. That's a community called Shishmara. It's, it's on a sandbar for all sakes and purposes. It's like Florida, except frozen. And it's it's literally eroding. Um, they they have to move. Relocation is underway. They're trying to find a place to go. Um, and, but meanwhile, people are it's a relatively thriving community population. They're growing lots of new births, lots of young families. Uh, and so it's, they're kind of stuck in this, well, this is our traditional land. Uh, this is where we hunt. This has been a, a seasonal hunting camp for uh, these people for centuries, if not longer. But it's, um, it's washing out from beneath their feet. And so what are people doing in response to these dramatic climate change impacts? Um, Climate migration is this idea, it's a word that was coined by Robin Bronin, who's an Alaska civil rights lawyer um, a number of years ago. Uh, this idea that people are gonna have to move, environmental circumstances are gonna force people to move um, as a result of things like erosion, the communities you know, eroding off of the, the coast. So is that happening? And one of the things that we've been doing in this research project, Sustainable Futures North, uh, is trying to look for signals of that. Um, if people are actually starting to leave, as a result of these impacts. And the interesting thing is that the answer is, by and large, unexpectedly, no. So this, this is 
me, this is net migration for all of these years for 43 Arctic communities in Alaska. Um, this is none. If it's on the positive side, that means people are moving in to rural communities. If it's negative, they're moving out. Okay, so yes, people are leaving these communities. People are. But I'll show you what's an interesting thing on this next graph. But before I do, I want to point out, you know, we have all these ideas about what makes people leave places, uh, especially rural places. And uh, other economic crises, economic downturns, food and fuel prices are an issue. Uh, we expect these things to create stresses that will maybe make people leave. Uh, around 2008, if you look over here, uh, when we had uh, a, a large recession, the global fuel, um, food and fuel price, you'll see that around this period of time, net out migration from rural Alaska decreased instead of increased. So all of these issues combined, we think it's going to make people leave because it's be harder to live there, when in fact it actually slows down people's flight out of rural communities. Uh, and for a year, people were moving back in. Um, and so it's really interesting, and this, what this means is we need to think twice about what we assume about people's relationships with their rural communities and their homes, and what keeps them there, and why they stay, uh, which is an ongoing aspect of the research that we're doing. And so again, you're not intended to, to, to be able to read these, I just want you to see the general patterns. Uh, these are population dynamics for about 10 of these, for 10 of the 43 communities, all of which have event, were identified by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as in, as needing priority action as a result of, cl of climate change driven erosion. So you can see, for all of them except for more or less one, this is a special <coughs> case that we can talk about at this time, you see population trends are, are rising. Now despite that last graph I showed you about people, about net negative, you know, net out migration, and the reason is that births are offsetting deaths in these communities, and births are offsetting out migration. So what we know about people who are leaving is that it's largely uh, 20, year, 20, 30 year old women, younger women from these communities are the largest demographic, of people who are leaving rural communities in search of jobs. Eventually it seems like some, they go back, uh, we're not sure. Uh, but the point is all of these communities that are threatened, um, that have all these infrastructure challenges, uh, and where in some cases very dangerous climate change and environmental events such as flooding are happening, they're all growing. We need to think about what that means for how we address these problems uh, and how we understand how they're going to impact them in the future. It doesn't mean that people aren't going to have to leave eventually uh, if circumstances are, are, so it doesn't mean there's not a problem, it just means the problem is more complicated when we think about the, so, the social and the ecological aspects of change together. And so what's another development issue in the North, uh, policy issue in the North is development. So the same thing that happens when that sea ice melts, you can't use it to walk on, it's not there. Once it's gone, there's lots of things that other people who are not from the north want to do with that open, with that open water. Okay, so you have multinational oil corporations who see an, an, an ice-free Arctic as A-OK, -okay, as an opportunity to drill. Um, and so you have some interesting tensions in policy and how people, you know, in, in your political will to do something about these problems when you have large-scale economic interests uh, that can benefit while local-scale people are impacted. We also know things like you know, drilling impacts of systems resources, they impact whales, marine mammals, and so forth. Um, and as hard as they're trying to drill in the, in, uh, the north, it's not ice-free, it's still erratic environments so are dangerous, they keep pull, having to pull back their plans. Uh, and meanwhile, it's also important to note that there's no technology for cleaning up oil off of ice. So there's some challenges there. And then there's another issue with respect to shipping. Well, once it's open, the Northwest Passage, the, the, idea, the possibilities of sending ships instead of through the Panama Canal, through the Arctic, for provisioning from all over the world, this is on a lot of people's minds. And so you see at different levels, different actors at the, in the global society thinking about the changing Arctic in different ways. We're also seeing it in the mining industry as well. So this map just shows kind of the increases in a lot of the diamond production that's happening that's predominantly in the north, both the provincial north and the territorial north. And if we go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. No problem. Um, all these little dots on the map, so I've tried to grab northern Canada as best I can. I know you can't really see it, but um, all the dots represent an agreement between uh, oftentimes a mining company and an indigenous community. And so these agreements in the mining industry uh, have come along within the last uh, 20, 30 years. 
And communities oftentimes uh, negotiate everything from joint ventures, employment, skills training, uh, community development funding, and there's various kinds from socioeconomic to impact benefit agreements to exploration agreements to actually come on traditional territory and explore for mineral resources. So this is just to show you kind of the proliferation of mining development in the north. And on the next slide, what we'll see in one region in particular in northern Ontario, this goes from 19, uh, 1987 right through to 2013, the various types of um, agreements we're seeing between communities and mining companies. And while this might be a positive success story of communities being able to access uh, new employment opportunities as well as funding that they might not, not necessarily have had access to in the past, especially when it comes to re uh, resource revenues, there's also some underlying tensions emerging, especially between and within Aboriginal communities uh, over whether they should be developing on their traditional lands and at what cost. So are the economic opportunities that might come from the mining industry worth environmental destruction that might come along with it as well? <coughs> There's also some debate going on, I think, more from the academic perspective that's looking at, well, are these agreements another form of neoliberal policymaking, where we're devolving that responsibility of the state to actually do employment, education, skills training, community development onto corporate actors? And what does that mean? as policymakers, is that something we're okay with? Okay, so here's another one. A lot of these issues sort of combine that we've talked about, at least at the local level, uh, to impact people's food security. This is a, an emphasis of my own research. Um, and so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, we, we have entire sessions dedicated to food security, but we, we're just touching on some of them here um, to get you thinking about it. Um, generally speaking, uh, access at all times to safe, healthful, and culturally preferred foods. And that's, a, relatively speaking, a new addition to how people are defining food security. It's sort of devolving food security to a place-based, uh, uh, household and community-based phenomena, as opposed to thinking about uh, food, how much food's available for a nation, or um, how much grain you have in silos at the back of it. And, and what does that mean in the north? It means different things in different places. This is the food from the land. This is a, an Athabasca man with a traditional fish wheel. Um, a good friend of mine who passed away recently um, who ran a community garden in his home community. And, and then food from the store. And this is an interesting uh, picture, I think. This is from Fort Yukon, Alaska. And there's two things about it. One is I think it's a little sparse looking, maybe. And two, you can't read it. There's a little piece of paper hanging there on, on the upper right-hand side. Uh, and it's an alert uh, from a handful of years ago about a citrus freeze that happened in California and how as a result there wasn't going to be any citrus. And, and it was illustrative to me, illustrative to me, because here we are in, 400, in Fort Yukon, which is just north of the Arctic Circle, 90 miles north of here. Um, and there, it was an, you know, an example of how their food supply, at least food from the store, they were remote and they were vulnerable as a result to disruptions that happened half a world away in California. The very next year, incidentally, I went was when the E. coli, an E. coli breakout happened on bagged spinach, and I happened to be in Fort Yukon when they were putting up a similar sign uh, for greens. People in Minto that year had their own spinach and other produce, so at least some. And so that's a bit of an, a bit of an illustration. And so you, ha you have all of the, oh, there's the produce alert that, for the spinach. So you have all these, these interacting forces. You have fuel prices which are out of people's control and amplified in the north. Um, you have environmental change, which is impacting people's ability to travel across the land. Uh, and you have, when people need that extra food security of going to the store um, for food, that you have that system also being vulnerable as a result of, of the long distances. Um, and when communities are overconnected to those sources of food, they're especially vulnerable. Um, and then you also have all these different policies regarding all of these things, whether it's about transportation, food safety, whether it's regulation of hunting and fishing seasons, um, international treaty obligations. So there's multiple co policy contexts for this at multiple levels. Uh, and so that's where I think that, some, that the exercise that we did with Judy earlier today was really informative because it's policy, but it's also not just policy, it's, in, it's, in, it's interpretation of policy by the people who are implementing policy. And then there's also the culture of enforcement. Uh, to what extent are people enforcing this or that 
uh, that varies from year to year, and that makes living in these places difficult. And you have to tease those things apart to know: can I hunt here or here at this time or this day? Well, this I know this trooper won't cite me for having a couple of extra salmon on my boat, but this guy will, and he works today, so let's go fishing. You know that kind of thing. But so what do we see? You know, there's there's not a whole lot of data out there for the north. There's some we know, generally speaking, that. The rural north in Canada is, is very food insecure. Um, in Alaska, uh, from the rural regions here, you have 20 to 25 percent of households uh, are food insecure. Um, drops down when you go, and that's well above the U.S. rate is 15.8 uh, as of I think 2012. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, so so the way that this is measured, uh, there's a couple of different measures up here. Um, every year, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, again, um, the agriculture people dealing with rural rurality, um, does a, a food security study. Actually, they do it in urban places as well, um, where they ask coping questions. They ask a series of, of questions about whether you're skipping meals um, because you can't afford food, or if you're borrowing food, if you're borrowing money. You're skipping meals so your kids can eat and that sort of thing um, and and that is done I don't remember the recall period for that for that instrument feeding America um, they do their estimates with um, in with um, economic data and looking at how much what the income levels are and how those relate to the um, whether or not people qualify for food assistance and they focus on this thing called the meal gap people who don't qualify for food assistance uh, that should and so, so we monitor it because we know even if they're not correct, they're precise enough, they're not accurate, they're precise enough to show us that there's a problem. Um, and then this over here, you see this sort of re regular trend over the years in, in the weekly cost of food for family poor. Um, for the bright, the, the, the colored lines are for rural communities, and then the gray line is for where we are, Fairbanks. So you see there's a fundamental difference here. And if we zoomed in on this, we did this for a number of more communities, that's pretty fun in the slide. You zoom in on 2008 when, um, the, when the food prices spiked as a result of the recession and there was a food crisis um, and fuel was very expensive. The, accordingly, market-based foods, the price jumped up. The interesting thing is they didn't correct back down after the fuel price came down. Uh, we did breakpoint analysis and we saw that the, it entered a new regime. The prices went up and they stayed there. Uh, why that happened, I don't know. And this is mine as well, isn't it? So this is for Canada. Um, just again to show you um, just a little bit of information. Um, Nunavut, you can see the bar in terms of households that are uh, food insecure households in Nunavut compared to the other provinces and territories. Um, and and this, is, this is just nearly at 40%. So very, high, very large problem in Canada, the Canadian North. And then if you, it's kind of hard to see, uh, but the, um, the largest group of households that are food insecure are either households relying on um, government benefits, they're relying on government benefits to get by, um, as opposed to income sources like employment, and they're either um, individuals or unschooled um, or um, couples with children, and um, I can't read that there. I apologize. Um, with one parent. With one parent, right. Households with children with one parent, thank you. So to give you a sense of some of the, the realities in the north, this is in the Northwest Territories in a place called uh, Igulik. Igulik is on the mainland of Canada, but a fairly remote northern community. Every year I have a colleague of mine, Nicole Mardo, and she goes into the local store to take photographs of food for them. So if you've got a pen with you, I would like you to write down four pieces of food that you buy on a regular basis, and what you pay for them in your hometown. One small head of cabbage. A brick of butter. What's that? If you don't know, you can guess what you might pay in your local store. So a brick of butter, small head of cabbage, one quarter of a watermelon. One quarter. <laughs> so just a quarter. A box, and I think it's 24. 12. 12 pogo sticks. Oh, uh, sorry. Maybe it's 24 public. It's a hot dog, corn dog, dog with breaded on a stick. Corn dog. Oh, man. 24 of those. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason. <laughs>
and the fifth, the fifth item is 12 can of pop, of soda pop. Like a small can? Just your small so can. Yeah. yeah. Standard can you buy in a vending machine, or a case of 12 cans of pop. So you can guess what your item is, you can add them up. Let's take this here. So, quickly here, we're going to a pound of butter. What do you pay for a pound of butter? Roughly. Four dollars. Six ninety nine. Six ninety nine. So in the community of Akula, they're paying nine dollars and nine cents for a small brick of butter. Nine oh nine. So in southern Canada, it would be about four to five. Maybe. So nine dollars. We're gonna go first with the can. Twelve cans of ginger ale. Four ninety eight. Four ninety eight in the U.S. Six bucks. Six four two. That's Walmart price right there. Walmart price? This is not a Walmart price. Oh, that's $82.49 That's eighty-two dollars and forty-nine cents Canadian for twelve cans of pop. Yeah. This is in northern Canada. This is northern Canada in a community called the Gula. Eighty-two dollars for twelve cans of pop. We'll come to a reason why this is a second machine. Twenty, sorry, pogo sticks. Corn dogs. Twenty corn dogs. Twenty corn dogs. What do you pay for those? Seven dollars. How much? Five sixty-nine. Thirty-five dollars. Thirty-five dollars in the gulay for twenty pogo sticks. A head of cabbage. Small head of cabbage. Dollar twenty-nine. Dollar twenty-nine. Three dollars. Twenty-eight fifty-four. Jesus. Twenty-eight fifty-four for a small head of cabbage, and finally, we're going for one quarter of a watermelon. Two twenty-nine. Two twenty-nine. So the price is right. As you're listing prices, I'm giving you the little bounty. Right, 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 right. He's crashed. For your watermelon, you're going to go thirteen dollars. That's right. One quarter of a watermelon. Oh, you need two more watermelon. That's right. Why are food prices so high in the north? In Canada? Transportation. Normally most of this food is flown in. And in Canada two years ago, and it's very much context matters, Canada had a program called Food Mail. And it was a program that offset the cost of food if you lived in northern remote and isolated communities. And that money went to you as an individual as part of your income tax. So every year if you lived in the north, you would get a rebate from the government to offset your costs. That program has been discontinued. The program has now been replaced by a program called Food North. Food North now provides the subsidy to get food to the north to the company that provides it, not to the individual. So the company that provides it, the grocery store, is supposed to apply the money that they've received as a subsidy to the food that they're now selling in the north. However, much like the story that Phil was saying, what we're seeing in northern Canada is that although companies are being subsidized to provide food to northern residents, the actual cost to northern residents has not gone down by the equivalent cost of the subsidy to individuals. So we still see high costs. The reasons why we see ginger ale at $82 is it does not qualify for the food program. It is not a, um, in the food guide, it's not an essential high quality food. And so it has no subsidy to it. And it is also, if you bought a case of pop, incredibly heavy and bulky product. And so when you mail it up, it is incredibly expensive to do so. Most people in the Gulick are not paying these prices. Most people in the Gulick rely on a barge that comes up once a year from Montreal. They get what looks like a Christmas catalog, except it's entirely of food, and they would place one order for the entire year. And they would order all the toilet paper they need for the year, all of the pop they need for the year, birthday cards, presents, and it would come up in August once the ice clears, as you're seeing on the video, and this would come into their community, which means that uh, my friend Nicole every year gets to play a fun game, she to convince her children to start, and it is to take the toilet paper roll out of the toilet paper, because they have a huge worth of supply of toilet paper they have to store in their house. And so they push the, to the tubes out so they can condense the paper to put it into bags to slide it under beds, because they have to store a year's worth of toilet paper somewhere in their house or their garage. What you also speak to is a lot of people, especially on the Northern Airlines, if they're flying south for medical services, perhaps education, uh, they will bring back a lot of food with them on the airplanes, and a lot of the Northern Airlines have special policies around that. This is the after the food program was cancelled in Canada, 
uh, you can imagine the, the public outrage that was taking place, uh, and it got national national coverage in the media for uh, for a number of months. Uh, and is actually back in the parliament. Uh, there's a committee meeting at the moment in the Northern Caucus uh, trying to put forward a, a new policy provision uh, around this to replace this program. Because you can imagine trying to feed yourself, let alone a family of five. It sounds like you know, you've got $82 and some ginger ale. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to spend much on pot. Um, so that's just one reality in, in the Gulag. It, it's not the reality of every community. Every northern community is fundamentally different depending on anything from the frequency of flights that come in and out of the community to how often people from the community might be going south. If there's somebody that goes out on a regular basis, different scenario that takes place. But fundamentally different than the south. There, there's a similar bypass mail program still in effect in Alaska that helps keep the prices a little bit further down. Um, also, and this is a really interesting um, recent development, is rural Alaskans are relying very much on Amazon Prime which is free shipping, which people started doing in Canada, but they canceled to Nova, right? Canceled to the north. Oh, to the north period because of the cost of shipping that they were having to eat. So people were trying to innovate with these, these sort of commercial subsidies in a, in a sense, but, um, but how vulnerable does that make you? How, how sustainable is that, I guess, is the question. Um, so the next um, set of policy issues, transportation and remoteness. So this kind of connects into what we were just speaking about. And this is just a quick map of uh, Northern Ontario again, which has the most um, remote First Nation communities in Canada, uh, over 30 that are not accessible year round via roads. So they're fly in, fly out. So you can see all the ones with the little airplanes. Uh, they have no year round road access. And that becomes a bit of an issue because usually in the winter time they rely on winter roads. But with climate change, we're seeing a shorter season for winter roads and also the road conditions are deteriorating. So this is just an example. Uh, Ryan has used it in some of his lectures. This is the Mackenzie Highway. This is the longest ice road in the world. It runs from Yellowknife. Anyone know where it ends? So it goes from Yellowknife and it connects to which community? No. Don't want you to mention? Okay. It's not to Gulick, it's about halfway to Gulick. So the greatest irony is there's no community at the end of the road. Why are they shipping on this road if there's no community? You betcha. The end of the road is three diamond mines. Oh. Jericho, Diavik, thank you, Kat is the third. Um, and what they're bringing up there is largely you know, supplies for the workers, for the camp, equipment, building supplies, because those are incredibly expensive to bring up by plane or sometimes physically impossible to put onto a plane. And so they build an ice road, usually opening about the middle of January of the year and it continues until the end of March and they truck things in non-stop uh, for that 12-week period. However, the challenge has become that the ice road season is getting shorter and shorter. It's opening up later and later every year, and it's closing earlier and earlier. This year, the ice road closed on February 22nd. So as of February 22nd, the road was no longer secure enough to support trucks to go across. What we see in places like northern Manitoba, is we in Northern Ontario does this as well. They have a graduated system that as the road gets less and less secure, they say to truck drivers, you can only bring 80% of the weight of your truck or 60%. But it means that they've shipped the truck full from the south and it gets to the north, but they can only take 60% of the load into the community. So they have to leave 40% of their, of their weight on the side of the road. And then they truck it in. They might come back and get it. If the road's slow, they'll truck it back in. Um, but I have a beautiful photograph I forgot to bring my mother just off the road uh, near Thompson, Manitoba. It's over to Pickwood today, and they were taking in community deep freezers, the, 20, the very long deep freezers, and they could only get two-thirds of them in. They left the other third sitting on the highway in the boxes, and the road closed before they could get the last third of the boxes in. And so they now have to sit there until the winter opens in 10 months. So you've got a 
gigantic order of deep freezers sitting on the highway. We wanted to show you just a quick clip of a very popular show, uh, I Throw Checkers, <laughs> to give you a better sense of uh, what exactly we're talking about. Anyone know what a truck driver makes for their 10 weeks trucking from Yellowknife to the Diamond Mines? <laughs> it's pretty much the standard 250, 250,000 American for 12 weeks of work. You can talk about around $850,000 because it's all based on how many trips you make. I've seen some people thinking they're the wrong <laughs> The Arctic is perhaps the deadliest place on Earth. Very when the cool winter grips this stunning wilderness and temperatures plummet to a lethal minus 50 degrees, everything, including the compass lakes, great and small, that are everywhere in the north. It is over these lakes that a top notch group of truckers go to work. Carving roads where none had existed before. These drivers maneuver their massive machinery over a precarious layer of ice so they can transport freight to the remotest communities in Canada's Northwest Territories. It looks like a frozen lake, it acts like a frozen lake, but it's what's underneath that frozen lake that's the unknown quantity. And that's all part and parcel of the challenge. It's make sure that you get it right. Because I, for one, don't want to go swimming. Uh, the guy went to here a week ago. We're here about three days. And uh, he said, that's enough of this. Didn't like, the, didn't like the cracking of the ice. So a lot of them, uh, when they actually drive over the ice, they drive with their window down just in case they do have to bail out. So it is quite a dangerous um, job that uh, a lot of these. You should also be familiar with it. Most drivers don't drive in the daytime either. The bit romanticized on yeah. the television show most <laughs> drive in the evening because the ice road actually shifts and moves and you can see the, the actual cracks in the ice much better with your headlights during the nighttime because it will create glare uh, as opposed to the daytime when it's quite bright out. So most of the driving is done at night and your maximum speed, although not seen on the yeah. documentary very well, typically is around 60, 40 to 60 kilometers an hour. So if you're not driving the massive speeds that you might sometimes believe you are on the show. In our final couple of slides, um, one of the issues is also governance. And one of the things we just wanted to highlight is just the complexity of governance structures in the North. Brian, you see this, one? this is the Arctic Council. I'm not sure if anyone familiar with the Arctic Council. Sometimes referred to as the A5. They are the international body um, that has been responsible for the North, or they've made themselves responsible for the North. Five nations are. Canada. So we have Russia, Norway, uh, US, Norway, US, Norway, Canada, Iceland, Norway. So close. <laughs> in Canada, the United States, you have Russia, you have Norway, and you have Denmark. Those are your five Arctic Five members. They're not the only five countries in the Arctic, but they make up the Arctic Five. And this is particularly why the Arctic Five is maybe on your horizon. The Arctic Five countries, particularly as ice melt is taking place at the polar caps, have now decided upon a set of rules for how to divide up the Arctic. The polar ice cap was always seen as almost an international territory, and now the five countries are putting together bids to an international tribunal to try to determine the boundaries in the Arctic. And so each country is trying to determine and find evidence of where their continental shelf starts, where it ends, where their exclusive rights go to. And as you can imagine, these five countries have not all submitted bids that match each other. There are absolute conflicts on them. You might have heard between Canada and Denmark, leaving flags on islands, putting <laughs> flags on the ocean floor to claim it. Um, but nonetheless, the Arctic Five Council has uh, a process in place that all five bids have been put in or they're Reports have been submitted. They're supposed to be adjudicating over the next year. It will be then soon announced. However, this is being absolutely um, shunned and contested by two countries. And they are not necessarily the two countries that you would normally associate with the Arctic and how to divide the Arctic. It is China and it is Japan. 
Why did China and Japan care about the internet? That's right, it's shipping. It's a purely, not purely, but one is around how to get things there um, and wanting to re remain it as an international territory, much like you would see with the kind of a canal uh, or other international flocks. Oh, they're, they're involved. They're also on the sidelines. Um, however, those two countries, uh, the Scandinavian countries, have an agreement in principle. Uh, and so they have um, been fighting, I think, partly through the Norwegian A5 membership. Uh, because the three are tied with, uh, with their water uh, active legislation, and so they've had a kind of an indirect route into the A5. Yes? That's just another look at it of how it gets played. Yeah, so this is if everyone got just simply based on their geographical coordinates and you took it right to the North Pole, this would be what slice of the pie you should get, but if you go back a slide. Reality will not look like that. <laughs> this is where it gets complicated and it's going to get messy and it will be very interesting to see what happens when the A5 Council comes out with their decision, because they're not a binding decision. Four of the five countries might say, that's a great decision, and one country might simply say, Forget it, we're walking away, the process was flawed, and not adhere to it. So it'll be a very fascinating to see how it all plays out. And political tensions uh, seem to rise regularly, partly on the prospects of mining companies about whether or not there's mineral wealth beneath the polar ice cap, and who gets to, to charge taxes and royalties on it. We also wanted to show just some of what are called the modern treaties in uh, Northern Canada. And so these all represent different kinds of land claim agreements that have been negotiated between the federal government and uh, various uh, indigenous groups across the North. And then within these, each indigenous group would create their own system of governance to help manage their territory. So this is just an example of one governance model and you can see the complexity of how it exists. And then you're still within, though, that territorial government as well. So you've got this multi-level governance system that's at play. And this can cause some significant tensions. And one example that kind of highlights this is the Peel Watershed, which is in uh, northern Yukon. And what ended up happening as part of the Yukon Umbrella Final Agreement was that a series of planning commissions were set up. And they have representatives for the Peel uh, Watershed Regional Planning Commission of uh, four members that are nominated by the four First Nations, as well as two from the territorial government. They started a planning initiative in the 2000s to come up with a regional land plan for that region. They ended up developing one, uh, agreed on uh, conserving 80% of the territory, so making sure that no development happens on 80%. All of the First Nation communities approved that plan, as did the planning commission, and the territorial government decided that that number was too high. So they started their own um, parallel planning process and decided to approve a plan that only protected 20%. So the four First Nation communities, along with some of their partners, took the territorial government to court. They won the initial court case. The territorial government then appealed it. At the appeals court, the judge did side with the Aboriginal communities, saying that it didn't follow the spirit and the intent of the umbrella agreement but that it had to go back to the process where they became divided. So the communities are still apprehensive about whether or not if they redo the process, does that still give the territorial government the power to veto any decision that's made? So it's now going to the Supreme Court of Canada. So you can see the complexity of decision making that also exists in the North. And just in our final couple of uh, minutes, uh, one policy issue in the North that kind of, it, is exacerbated, I think, by some of the issues that we've talked about in terms of access and, and transportation. It's really um, caused, though, as well by colonial government policies that we've seen in Canada, as well as long-term marginalization of uh, Aboriginal people and a government failure to act. And Ray was speaking this morning that a government decision to not do something is a government decision still. And that's really been an issue across Northern Canada in Northern Ontario, where I'm from, communities and people are hurting. In one community, PIC, the suicide rate was 250 per 100,000 people in 2011, nearly 20 times the national average and the highest of anywhere in the world. We also have extreme poverty, substandard housing, problems with education and healthcare. Oftentimes, kids in their communities 
have to leave at 12 years old to go down to a southern city to finish high school. And so can you imagine at 12 having to leave your home, your culture, your family, and go to a new city where everything is new at that age? So there's high dropout rates. In some communities, most of the working age population does not have a high school diploma. So this impacts everything that you try to do with, when you're working with these communities. And there's also a huge mistrust with government policymakers because of this history. And so the, some, those are some of the challenges that we wanted to highlight in the North. Uh, some good, some bad. And uh, this is gonna help bring your discussions going forward for the next couple of weeks on new projects. So Phil wants to add anything? No, that's good. I mean, we have some time scheduled left for discussion and conversation, and we were hoping that John would help us I mean, we could just open it up for questions, or if John, if you wanted to sort of give us some structure to that. Do you want to do coffee or something? And there's, there's more coffee if people want to get up, because we have about five minutes, to five minutes to stand up, and, and then we'll get back going again. We have another hour, really, before, and before we want to conclude. We have half an hour for the session, and dinner is at six. So. I will say too, just this final one. So uh, First Nations are also facing a huge crisis in terms of uh, drinking water across the country, which seems kind of ironic in yeah. a country like Canada that has so much fresh water available, uh, but uh, many communities aren't able to properly treat that water to be able to drink. And it's been the focus of both the United Nations, Human Watch Canada, several documentaries looking at that issue and why it's there and how can we help solve that issue. And so in some communities, people are getting sick, they're getting skin ailments because of the water. Uh, some of it's, um, there's some industrial ramifications with mining and, and forestry that have painted the water in some communities. And so we've got all kinds of challenges that still need to be addressed. And it occurred to me that I might want to ask if we have some participants that have questions, but go ahead. Um. I'm sorry, I'm not clear, quite clear as to what exactly the First Nation, what do you mean when you say First Nation? Sure, so in Canada, uh, oftentimes you'll hear uh, First Nation, Indigenous, or Aboriginal. Okay. So First Nation um, takes into account... First Nation would largely be defined by the Indian Act of Parliament. So in Canada, um, back in 1880, we'll make up a number. Uh, the Parliament created the Indian Act and it recognized certain individuals as being a member of the Indian Act. Uh, but, but, but yeah, but not all members that would maybe be thought of as indigenous were included in the Indian Act. So we have a bit of a fuzzy definition system, much like rural, much like the North. And so you'll hear terms like First Nations, uh, which is a, a legal term under the Indian Act. Metis is now a legal term under the Indian. It must be recognized by the federal government. It's not yet clear how. Uh, and then you would have Indigenous and Aboriginal, uh, which have Inuit, Métis, and First Nation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we were all pretty flabbergasted at those prices and yeah. certain items. Um, but is that largely driven because you showed some, I guess, I don't want to say Western because they're not Western foods, but they are Southern. Southern global, mid-global, mid let's say, um, foods. So how much of that has changed their food ways by introducing these foods and then it creates the problem that with the prices? So is there a move back to get to the more you're starting, foods? Yeah, you're starting to see that, absolutely. Uh, community freezers, uh, youth going out on the land, doing hunting and trapping, fishing, bringing it back, and ensuring that the elders have access to country foods. Uh, in some communities in northern in northern Saskatchewan, they're actually not allowed to share food. And the provincial government regulates that. So there's some regulations that don't make sense. And so you would think you would want people to have that traditional lifestyle. If they want to be able to share, say they went out and got a caribou with friends and family in town. But, and most do under the radar, but you can't do it in a formal way in some communities. So there's still some disconnect. Uh, the territorial north much better, I think, at that. We see a lot in northern Ontario with community food um, sharing and community freezers, so there is definitely, I think, a resurgence of it. If you were to walk into the Google store, you would not find any meats. Yep. They don't sell any meats whatsoever because most people are fishing or hunting. 
So they don't carry that. The other challenge with their pricing, if you look simply at the supply and demand, is that the population of Bulik is less than 2,000, and they have a high amount of spoilage. Um, and so the, the cost of it, whether it's cabbage, whether it's apples, whatever it might be, um, a huge challenge there. Yeah, some of those items, Nicole said to me, the pogo sticks, because that was the, the desire of her daughter for her birthday. <laughs> she wanted pogo sticks uh, for their birthday dinner. The, the other thing we're starting to see is really innovative thinking around uh, getting fruits and vegetables and growing them locally. So we're seeing a lot of things uh, around greenhouses and different growing techniques uh, being imported from Asia, actually, and also uh, nutriponic systems using fish farms to grow produce. So we're starting to see that, which is great, and hopefully can help with some of those food security issues that Bill put up. You can tax sharing. So um, is there a black market for people who are going around the bureaucracy in the north? Can you say the answer? Since you can't tax sharing, yes. there was no way yes. the government employees to get their, their money. So how how would you, uh, is there a black market? So they're not taxing the black market. So how, how would you, is that, is that exist up in the North um, I think the, the informal, the sharing economy is huge. So uh, definitely you see that. And then, like we were saying, a lot of people, when they go south for appointments, are bringing food back. Even researchers, if you're working in the north, you always ask ahead of time if there's anything that can be brought up. There we go. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in to listen to another uh, webinar today from the ISERPS 2016 um, seminar. It's a two-week seminar be currently being held in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, attendees are usually students and faculty members from North America and Europe. Uh, so it, it, this is the first time that we've offered the webinar series as a as part of the seminar series. Usually you have to be there in person to be able to hear some of the presentations. Um, and notably there is work that the students are doing over the next two weeks on comparative rural policy. Um, so part of the goal of the seminar series is a learning opportunity for those students, but also um, to bring together a variety of different viewpoints on rural policy to allow for international uh, comparative to occur. Mm -hmm. So once again, uh, we plan on putting these recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you're watching these and are interested in attending uh, the ISERPS um, seminar series next year will be held I believe in Spain and it usually alternates between North America and Europe. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be in Alabama next after that in 2018 but I encourage you to contact anyone through the ISERPS or RPLC network. Um, you can visit the ISERPS website or the Rural Policy Learning Commons network uh, website to find out more information and thank you again for tuning in.